Hello and welcome to Tools in the Shed, a podcast powered by Cars Guide, ready to rip into car stuff that's caught our eye this week. I'm Cars Guide Deputy Editor James, and with me is Adventure Editor Crafty. Aloha. And regular contributor Steve. Hello. Uh, that's the Kiefenstein. That's Hello. Like it, Corby. Good to see you, mate. I'd this like week, for something. We, and, uh, and you've got a shirt on this week. That's unusual. Well, that's unusual. <laughs> no pants, but I've got a shirt. That goes without saying. Um, this week, we're looking at automotive brands that are ticking over, just ticking over so far in 2020. Are they in for the long haul? Should be an interesting discussion. We'll look at some fresh metal in the Cars Guide garage, and we'll also look at a dating app designed to bring Tesla lovers together as in together, in this week's Musk Watch. So stay with us. But first, we had some feedback from last week's show, and um, the main topic of conversation was the MG Gloucester, large Prado and Kluger-threatening SUV, seven seats, the whole thing. Um, It's primarily for the Indian market at the moment, but it might find a home here. And it captured a lot of feedback. There were several commenters saying, Look, this is just the LDV, isn't it? And and I think we mentioned that in our story, that it is uh, unashamedly based on that vehicle. They both come out of the same uh, kind of stable, as it were, but there are differences in engine and, and other bits and pieces. So um, yes, but no. Uh, Marco Vess says the MG Gloucester is interesting, but with Australia's appetite increasing for huge US-style pickups, he's wondering about the Photon Big General. And I don't know whether you guys have seen the Photon Big General. Oh, um, it, it's a pretty blatant ripoff of the Ford F-150 Raptor, in my opinion. Um, oh, yeah. the, the headlight treatment, and for those on YouTube, there'll be a picture of uh, the vehicle up there right now. Um, there are some, <clears throat> shall we say, similarities. And it'll have a choice of two-litre engines, two-litre petrol, two-litre diesel, and a two-and-a-half-litre diesel. So it doesn't mimic the Ford in that regard. Um, but uh, it was shown, it's going to be shown in Beijing later this month. So look, you never know. You never know if the, if the Chinese wave continues to build, it, it could be part of it. It could be paddling in. Mm-hmm. Um, Peter Clarkson says MG, uh, he hopes MG brings the Gloucester to Australia and New Zealand uh, and wishes they would badge LDV as Leyland DAF. And then maybe LDV would get some of the cash, cachet that MG seems to be accumulating. And we actually ran a story on uh, Ask the Guides, or we, resp- we responded to a query. And LDV used to stand for Leyland DAF Vans. Yeah. And uh, now it's just LDV. It's not an acronym for, for anything, really. But I thought that's an interesting idea. And, of course, LDV in China is Maxis. So there are all kinds of names floating around. But what do you reckon, Crafty? Would Leyland DAF Vans have a little more uh, kind of pulling power than LDV? I reckon so, mate, because they're they're a weird mob like Land Rover lovers. They are uh, they go way back, um, and any mention of the of the brand and the name, they get all sort of sweaty and excited. So, <laughs> so absolutely, it's like um, uh, uh, recently we'll get onto this later. I drove the Fortuna. I don't know why they called it the Fortuna. They should have called it the Hilux Seven or the yeah. Hilux Wagon or the Hilux Adventurer. Because yeah. if you're selling off the back of the strength of loyalty to the name, it would go mental. Like it would, right. it would sell, you right. know, far more than what it does at the moment. Great Same point. with LDVs. No one's got any idea what LDV is unless you investigate a little bit uh, deeper. Yeah. But if they called it Leyland or Leyland Daff, something, you'd get all those people that love those sort of original British sort of connected vehicles. Absolutely. Yeah. At least Leyland means something. You just say LDV doesn't mean anything. And yeah. mean, no. like, MG no. Gloucester has a nice English ring to it when it should be MG Guangzhou. <laughs> right, yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Where, where, is the, where is the name? Is the name just to, you know, try and some sort of ties with the, with the mother country or something? With well, it's the an English UK. city. It's an English city. That's, it's, a, it's just that whole thing. Look, look, pretend that we're English. Look over there. We're, we're English. We're English. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here it's... <laughs> I, was, um, I, was, I was in Gloucester. I oh, know Sorry, different different name, but I was in Leicester Square in London once and an American came up to me and said, excuse me, sir, can you tell me where Leicester Square is? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Said, I did, but you're in Leicester Square. So <laughs> Gloucester, you know, they could have yes, called it yes, that. the Gloucester. <laughs> well, <laughs> think about this. Yeah. By rights, um, Pittsburgh should be Pittsburgh. 
Yeah. It's Pittsburgh. Borough. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. They can't say they say coop as in chicken coop instead of coupe. So they got yeah. correct. Oh, yeah. Correct. Exactly. Correct. Yeah. Anyway, look, senior Bob wants MG to take the next logical step, which would be an MX5 style, you know, sports car. Uh, and and he says that would play to their uh, take them back to their roots. Get it? Roots, um, <laughs> and, as in the Roots group. But yes. lofty visions, lofty visions came swooping out of his lofty position and yeah. said that actually MG was BMC British Leyland and that Roots was, he reminds us that Roots was Hillman, Sunbeam, Talbo and a few others. Um, so there you go. But, but it, an interesting idea. Um, lofty actually thinks that what they'll do is keep their powder dry until MG's built up a little more cred in the market, even more awareness. And then they might pull, pull something out of the fire in terms of a, a performance-focused car. Because he did take us back to times past when MG produced all kinds of bonkers things. He, he uh, called up the, the MG X-Power um, SVR, which was uh, truly insane. <laughs> he, he says, you know, that design team was ready for anything. Maybe they, it, it's unlikely that they still exist, but he thinks MG will, will turn around and, and do something to surprise us in the fullness of time. Yeah, uh, but the faster um, you drive an MG, the more likely the panels are to fly off. So I don't know about a sports car. <laughs> <laughs> faster you go, the more panels. <laughs> well, risky to me. Risky. Lofty says Lofty says he had a '77 MG Midget, um, and he'd love to see a new roadster from MG, just as long as it doesn't come with British Leyland build quality. Smiley face, um, <laughs> which is which is further to our conversation of just a minute ago. Leyland means something. I don't know whether it always means good things. Yeah, um, it means. It means well, more than LDV. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, De Kook also chipped into that conversation, saying he he'd like to see it, but he thinks that part of the market is is kind of in a lull. Uh, maybe it's even dead and and not coming back. But he he had a smart for two cabrio, um, which he had to sell before coming to Australia. He's uh, been spent a lot of time in Germany. He's now living in Australia, and looking at pictures of that car, people on YouTube will be able to see it. It just reminds you how tiny, how tiny that thing is, and how strange yeah. it looks without a roof. But uh, yeah. anyway, that was De Kook's transport in Germany. No, I drove the Smart Foot Two from Melbourne to Adelaide with a photographer and all of her. Wow! And that was wow. Super, one of the uh, more challenging trips of my life, but super, super fun car. Like you could yes. feel, you could feel the wheelbase with your back and your toes. <laughs> <laughs> what? What? You were being overtaken by road trains. I take it then. Oh yeah. Okay, but- Take my shopping cart. Once we put all the cameras yeah, in, I was going to take it by pedestrian, James. Don't worry about that. Drive all the way with the seat out the window, mate. Yes. Yeah. yes. Out, out each window, though. Yeah. yeah. Well, you can put your arms out. Um, so, yeah. Rico, he's, he's harking back to two decades ago, and actually it's a bit more than two decades, uh, when Hyundai first entered the Australian market, and it was 1986, and you think about those cars, it was the XL, and it was, uh, you know, price competitive, affordable, if you want to put it that way. Had a lot of equipment for, for the price, but now he says only uh, Toyota and Mazda are selling more cars um, than them, and he reckons that the Chinese brands are just taking down those notes, and they're going from the same playbook start and, and maybe they'll finish in similar positions so it's a fair enough theory mm. yeah, i think if you look at the way the korean we, we used to laugh at the koreans I, my girlfriend had an excel i hated that car but um it's a an incredible how far they've come and i30s now you know it's something you'd shop against a golf it's, it's unimaginable yeah. in the 80s or 90s you would say that yes yes the, the, the other thing to say about the south korean car business is that as the cars have progressed South Korean society has changed quite a bit. You know, from, from 1986, a lot of people in the industrial part of South Korea were working seven days a week and they weren't working for very much. And mm. things have changed in terms of industrial relations, uh, such as it is. People are working fewer hours for more money and the, the Hyundais of this world simply aren't able to make those cars for a similar price, relatively speaking, as they did 25 years ago. So the, the Chinese have come in and captured that that part of the market. It, it, who knows whether it goes the same way? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you got, if you've yeah. got price, I mean, the price advantage is huge, isn't it? They, they can definitely undercut everyone. I mean, if you go yeah. back to when Japan came in, it's the same thing. Affordable oh, cars, same well, thing. Just, yeah. Same deal. Same deal. So Bertie Bertie agrees. He says the Chinese vehicles are where Hyundai was circa late nineteen eighties. 
except they only had the Excel. And MG, of course, now has relatively a broader offering. Um, he sees it like a Chinese banquet. And in fact, he says, um, I'll take a Gloucester with a prawn cocktail, a short soup, mixed entree, uh, finished with a banana fritter with two scoops. And, uh, but what and he does say, the cost, the, the, the cost may be um, cheap and it, it is full of fruit, but how satisfying will it be? Um, I think he, he quite rightly says, look, the Prado is attractive for many due to the perception of robustness and they've got that huge dealer network. And when you think about it, Toyota has invested in its product and its dealers and its communication over a long period of time and it's, it's fought for that reputation and it certainly has it. So, you know, MG has a way to go. There's, there's little doubt about that, I suppose. I just pictured can... Bertie driving away on a yum char trolley. <laughs> <laughs> Get out of my way. Later, later. Yeah. Twin, do you know, do you know my significant other had to acquire one of those? or No, sorry, a work colleague did uh, for part of a museum exhibition and they are not cheap. I remember it was um, several thousand uh, dollars because they're stainless steel. Uh, wow. Those yum char trolleys. So yeah, beware. I'd like to have one in my house. I could eat yum char three meals a day. Ah, oh, same here. It's I, I, a person I used to work with called it yum chow. Yum chow, uh, which I thought was always more more appropriate. But it was anyway. In in general feedback, more general feedback. Pranav Shroti says loved it. Gave us three thumbs up. Thank you very much, Pranav. That's uh, much appreciated. But um, Home Wilson, this, this comment was lost in the filters of YouTube, I think the profanity filter uh, for a while, but <laughs> I, I, I thought I'd drag it out because I thought it was such a, a fantastic comment. He says, this has to be the shittest YouTube car program ever. <laughs> Should be called The Three Wankers Talk Shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't on that one. I feel disappointed. I love it. Hey, I'm I love it. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm actually drawn. I'm drawn to that name. I think it's, um, it's worth discussing a change to, you know, yeah, the three terrible. wankers talk shit. Yeah. Yeah. It's, good to, it's good to see that my mother's still commenting too. So. <laughs> <laughs> good on you, Mum. Um, From jail too, which is impressive. Nice. The Wi-Fi there is pretty good. <laughs> Be better than JC's. That's right. <laughs> Jim Danick says, congratulations on the 150th show. We did our 150th podcast last week, so that was good. And we did note that Jim uh, had a previous association with the Winton Motor Company where he'd um, experienced an unfortunate accident in the engine plant and lost all but one of the digits um, on his hands, uh, which, was, which was terrible at the time. I'm sure he's still suffering. But he says, even uh, despite the Winton accident, I can still give you a virtual thumbs up. So thank just you. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, just the one. Just the That's one. it. Just the one. Um, <laughs> William Goer says, please have Peter on more regularly. And that was Peter Anderson. So he's, uh, he's a big yeah. fan there. Yeah, and uh, obviously we'll take related that to him. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's his cousin. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So um, G-Man just uh, came at us. We'd been talking a couple of episodes ago about electric vehicles and hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles. And he reminded us that AGL's just announced it will have an EV subscription service. Um, and we ran a story uh, on this, in fact. Um, the starting rate's $2.99 a week. And, in fact, for that $2.99 a week, you can have either a Leaf or an Ionic EV. Everything's included, the registration, the insurance, the maintenance. Uh, you have a charger installed in your home, all that stuff. If you step up to $3.59, you can have a Kona EV. Or $5.99, you can have a Tesla Model 3. So there's AGL getting involved in, in the car business because of electrification. Well, so they'll be the new power companies. You know, you've got oil companies that dominate motoring, and they have these power companies that they're looking at it going, there's a massive yeah. opportunity for us here. Get, get involved no, in handing whatever. Yeah. I, I want me a bit of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Definitely. Oh, there, for sure. We also, we, also touched, we also touched on the Golf 8 GTI, um, soon to be available. And Adam Gill says, look, would you wait until you drive it before comparing it to, to other competitors? In that we were talking about i30N, and I think he makes a fair point. None of us have actually driven this car, and here we were um, giving forth on, on what it was not wasn't. Um, he's a little bit biased. He does have a Mark 7 GTI with the performance pack, but uh, point taken, Adam, uh, I, I, I hear you. Um, one thing he did say, though, is that he understands that the tech in the Generation 8 Golf, particularly the GTI, is horrendous, and apparently everyone who designed it was sacked. Really? <laughs> so, yeah. Go on. <laughs> gone. They're gone. So that's an interesting little tidbit. He reckons they need to engage the king of software, Tesla, 
uh, to help them out. But, yeah, so that wasn't a high point for the development of that car. No. no. <laughs> um, so BJ Banny uh, kind of agrees. He says, I don't understand the criticism of the GTI because the refinement is exactly the reason it sells uh, more than its rivals all around the world. We were saying that the i30 is a relatively uh, simple, quite engaging drive, very nimble, uh, feels light when you're driving it, that the Golf may have got a little heavier, a little more sophisticated and lost some of that in successive generations. But he's saying that the refinement is what people want in, in their hot hatch, a lot of them, and I think that's a fair point too. And the fact that the Golf just feels a lot more special inside. Like you feel yes. like getting, you feel like you've got more for your money. I think they're very yeah. different. They're very different cars in the way they feel and mm. in how they perform is a different thing. And it depends on what you're buying it for. People right. say they're buying a hot hatch to be carving up corners, but a lot of it is, you know, how you're going to feel every day when you get in it. Good point. That's a great point. Well, also, I think we had some feedback last week that um, in the Golf Eight GTI, even the tartan trim wasn't quite up to scratch. It didn't. It didn't feel like a Golf. It was just a bit mottled and. And uh, anyway, it was, there was a whole bunch of criticism last week. But it's fair comment. The refinement is what a lot of people are looking for when all said and done. Mm. Um, then we'll finish it off with some feedback on the Sorento because uh, Richard Berry had driven that last week and it was our, his car in the garage. Bertie was back again and mm. he says, geez, Kia, you cough up a beautiful looking SUV that could sell like hotcakes. Um, do they sell that well? Question mark is his is his question. <laughs> Yet you roll over the existing anemic drivetrains, no third row airbags, and an uninspiring towing capacity. So he sees there were some uh, some blind spots there in the specification, and the the side curtain airbags go to the ABC pillar, but they don't actually cover the window next to the third row oh, really? um, in that car. So that, yeah. that is a bit of a miss, I've got to say, and it would turn a lot of family buyers off, you'd reckon. Um, but then, um, who is it? Sham Max says, gives them something to update midlife. Um, but oh, Jim that's a says, bit cynical. I, yeah, I don't know. Just yeah. a bit. My safety <laughs> just updated things. How could, be, how could people be that cynical? Anyway, <laughs> um, but then Jim Dannett came in and said, I think the engines might be an Australian thing because of fuel standards. You know, we miss out on. A lot of different engines. I'm not sure if that's the case, but it's an interesting point. Um, Hammer Rocks, Hammer, Good old Hammer, comes in. He was our final commenter and says he's admired Kia ever since Peter Schreyer took over as their head of design in uh, 2006. Um, he calls out the Stinger, the Sorento, but even the little Picanto. The upcoming Carnival looks like it'll be a terrific-looking people mover if there is such a thing. Um, it'll be as close as you can get to it. Um, but he also said... The auto park feature, and, and Richard was demoing it in, in the video when he reviewed the car, that you can summon it from a very tight parking spot with actually ha out having to get into the car. Uh, he said there's no way in the world he'd use that because if you could park it in a space that tight, what are the people either side going to do? They're going to open the door and, and dent your car. And I, I had exactly the same thought. I yeah. suppose it's only useful if you've found your car in that, in that situation when you've come back to it. You can you can pull it out without having to kind of wiggle your way into the door. But yeah. I had exactly the same thought, Hammer, I must say. Yeah. And it works if everyone's got that technology. But I did see someone saying the other day praising um, Tesla for that because it was, was so useful for um, handicapped drivers. Right. Being able to summon the car every handicap. Yeah, to summon, yeah. So it's really useful for some people. Yeah. That's absolutely true. So thank you for all of that feedback. We're now going to move on to our main topic of conversation uh, for today which is a story that Andrew uh, chested and authored through the week. And he made the point that we so often look at the top of the market. Where are the, where are the top sellers? Who's number one, two, battling it out for honours, you know, in terms of the best-selling vehicles? What about at the other, other end um, of the scale? Who's probably on, on, on the edge, you know? They're, they're, um, they're maybe on the precipice of, of disappearing because sales aren't all they could be. And it is quite interesting when you look at the numbers – um, and in fact, Hammer Rocks, our old mate Hammer Rocks, uh, suggested a very similar idea as a podcast topic. So there you go, Hammer. Our our, our aim is to please, and we're we're actually doing something very similar uh, to your suggestion. Um, but the uh, main, the first one off the rank, or it, it's like the the lower five, if you like, is Alfa Romeo. Alfa Romeo uh, in the first eight months of this year has sold. 456 vehicles um, 
So when you think that the total market so far in 2020 is 125, nearly 126,000 cars, um, Alfa Romeo sold less than 500. Mm. It was a brand that was going to be selling 5,000 cars annually just to start with. Um, and then, you know, the world was its oyster from there. And it, it's simply not firing. Mm -hmm. And the weird thing is, I, I, I quite like, and most of those were Stelvios, right? I quite like the Stelvio. I think if you're going to buy a car, an SUV, because of the way it looks, that's the car you would have. Like, there's a few issues I have with the, with the fact that the gear lever feels too cheap, and that's, you know, that, you know, that bothers me every time I send it. But it seems like a great car, and I don't understand why people don't buy it. And the Julia as well. Julia's a great car. It just doesn't seem to have any uh, presence in the market. It's just not in the consideration yes. set for some reason. Yes. Yeah. Is, that a, yeah. is that a perception thing, though? Is that a brand perception thing, or is it just because they're, they're not that, you know, they're not spectacular, they're just pretty good? Because I haven't been in the thing. Oh, the still, yeah, yeah, well, it's a bad, it, 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 I mean, if you consider that so many people do at least consider a car because of the way it looks, I don't think it's hard to find a better looking SUV than the Stelvio. It looks fantastic. And uh, yes. and you can buy a really sporty one that's fantastic. Again, the Julia, the Julia just, I reckon most people don't even know it exists. I mean, it's a sedan, yes. a lot of people want sedans, but it's a pretty good car. I'm just. The, the, I think that's a really interesting point, Steve. I reckon they're pretty well kept secrets. You mm -hmm. know, there's. There's just not a lot of noise level about the product and brand out there in the marketplace. Maybe I'm not the the, the target audience, and I don't consume the media that that you know Alfa Romeo is is picking uh, to tell its story. But uh, it's pretty quiet as a brand. And I do wonder whether it's the ad dollars. I mean, are they just not? Is your, is your brand awareness just about? I mean, obviously, a lot of brand awareness is seeing cars on the on the on the road, and that's self self fulfilling prophecy. But are they not spending enough on you know big? big billboards, but there were still VO billboards. I remember seeing them. And right. now it seems to have disappeared. That you know, is it about spend? And in the modern environment, I guess they're they're selling, you know, advertising mostly on social media. So I don't see mm. them come up in my feed, but maybe that's maybe that's how they're trying to sell them. I'm not sure. It just doesn't seem to it doesn't seem to cut through. Whereas it, I think it still does pretty well in other markets. But yes. generally in your feed uh corbs are uh, incontinence pads, aren't they? <laughs> like that. well, my feed oh sorry, that's my, my, that's, my feed. Feed. that's your feed. That's right. <laughs> There's no cars in it, that's for sure. <laughs> well, look, we're staying with the same ethnic origins for, for number four, uh, which is Fiat, and it's a very similar number. Um, so 427 sales so far. And again, there's a hero, like you say, Steve, with Alfa Romeo, the Stelvio is by far the, the standout in terms of numbers sold. Well, here it's almost a one-model car company in that it's the 500. Um, there is the, the 500X, um, the SUV, and they've got the one, two, four, like the Abarth um, convertible, if you wanted to fold that in, but it's the 500. And it's been around for a while. It's had the odd freshen up, but it's been on the shelf for some time, and it just sort of trickles along. Mm. But back when you used to go to Europe, you'd see them everywhere. Like, And I, you know, I'll come out of the closet, so I quite like the 500. It's uh, I, yes. but it's the kind of car that just doesn't seem to make sense to Australians. We just don't, even though we live increasingly in, in cramped cities, we just don't want to seem to want to buy a car that small. Whereas everyone in Europe, yes. Europe except you have to park in Rome or London and so on, it makes so much sense. Yes. And it's really good, really good fun to drive. Everything about it, it's also kind of cool. I thought it would do well in, you know, inner city Paddington and Turak. I thought there'd be a lot of that, but you hardly ever see one. It just seems yes. to, again, is it, is, it, is it because people don't know about it or is it because people don't want it? It's hard to say, but it's not because there's anything wrong with it. Crafty, I know you were shopping between the Alphas and the Fiat 500. You were torn course, there for yeah. a while as, yeah, to, as to which way yeah. you were you were going to yeah. jump. Yeah, but, I'm but, always but after I'm, the Euro cool, mate. The... He's going to get two <laughs> 500s to chock up his giant SUV. <laughs> <laughs> that's, right. <laughs> that's right. Well, uh, the irony being, though, that, that the current Fiat 500 is so enormous compared to the original yeah. 500, you know, yeah, from, yeah. from back in the day. Um, yeah. That when you do actually look at it, sit in it, it's not that small. It's not big. Um, don't get me wrong. But like the new Mini, it's it's quite a sizable car, and it has to be for safety and and various other other reasons. But yeah, it hasn't fired. People people seem to want um, something that's more of a known quantity. The Aussie the Aussie SUV market is a pretty tough nut to crack, isn't it? If you if you're in a sort of a, a brand that's not so well established, not so well known. But do we have too many SUVs? I mean, maybe people just get, you know, overblown with everything and they just go, oh, bugger it, I'll just get a Prado. Or I'll just get you know, all this all this confusion of choice, you know, I'll just yeah. get a Land Cruiser, even though I live in Paddington or something, or, 
or especially. Oh, you moved, you've I'm, moved to Paddington, have you? No, no, no. That's amazing. No. <laughs> oh no. Okay. I was yeah. role playing there, uh, Jason. Just, playing. just like we do on our poker nights, mate. So, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah let's not go cards, there. Mate, so. But um, <laughs> yes. Well, I, I, I think number three is also in the same FCA stable, um, and it's Chrysler. So Chrysler has again uh, contracted down to to just the one model, and it's the three hundred. And as a reasonable part of that number is because um, at least the New South Wales Police Force, I'm not sure if, if others have, have opted for the high-performance SRT version as, as part of their highway patrol fleet. So there's some government sales in there. The number of private buyers bowling up and, and buying a Chrysler 300, I reckon you'd probably be able to count on the fingers of one hand. Um, so it, it's, just, it's just hanging on. And it's not a new car either by any stretch. I have to be honest, I would have said if you'd asked me that they pulled out of the country two years ago. Right. I honestly didn't know they were still selling cars. Like that's, <laughs> it was a genuine shock to me. Although I did get <laughs> by a cop in one the other day. So. Oh, really? You, oh, really? Oh, yes. You were, you were pulled over by a cop in one? No, no, I was followed for some distance. I was driving a Larry supercar, following another Larry oh, supercar. Okay. He, may, he may have heard us coming, I don't know. And yes. He just followed us for about 20 minutes with this kind of oh, look, of, look of expectant glee. He just wanted your <laughs> autograph, mate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he did on something, yes. On a fine. Now, the, the next one is not going to be a massive surprise. Um, it's Citron. Um, so, Citron, talk about being a secret. You know, I, I'm sure that a lot of mass market car buyers aren't even aware of the Citron brand, let alone the individual models. I doubt they'd be aware that those cars are sold in Australia. And the result is that so far in the first eight months of this year, 114 Citroens have been sold. Um, and bearing in mind again that our market is over 125,000 so far um, this year. So the Citroen brand accounts for that. Now, also worth noting is that there are 114, uh, sorry, that's 114 sales, 42 dealers. So 42 dealers carving up 114 sales means that it's 2.7 cars per dealer so far this year, which is 0.3 of a car per dealer per month. Well, so this, this supports my theory that it's actually a money laundering scheme of some kind. <laughs> they've been here, and they've been here for years and years. Anyone else would have given up by now. And like yeah, no. buying, buying a Citroen is like being a member of the Greens Party in Australia. Yeah. No one's going to take you seriously. If you're in Europe, everyone go, oh, that's a good job. Oh, yeah, yeah that's, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a good, good thing. <laughs> everyone doesn't take Citroen seriously. That's fine. Also, if you buy a Citroen, that's a car for life because you're never yeah. going to sell it second hand. Uh, well, that's and right. I'll, Why would you bother? Yeah. yeah. Well, well JC, so you say 42 the, the dealers. The dealers are also going to be put. Sorry, Crafty, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, sorry. You say 42 dealers and, you know, you spread them. What if it's just one really good dealer who's selling them all? The rest are just standing around. I don't know. The only point to make there is that um, I believe that all of those Citroën dealers would also be Peugeot. But Peugeot isn't setting the world on fire in terms of sales anyway. Um, they'd all, the majority of them would be in multi-franchise environments. But if yeah. you were a soulless Citroen, like you, you just sold Citroen, you're, you're not going to be putting food on the table, I'm afraid. No, <laughs> not a lot of camembert. No, 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 no. not at all. Well, we get to the uh, the top spot, and it's a it's a tricky one. So it's a bit a bit tricky because um, Chesto had defined his story as excluding the exotics, which are by design small volume, their their high profit margin, um, small volume uh, propositions. But Genesis is in that premium part of the market. However, I think it has aspirations for more than just a handful of cars. So it's fair enough to, in to include it here. And 99 is the, the number so far. Um, and the thing is, though, there are only two dealers. <laughs> so if you apply the same metric uh, as yeah. you do to Citroen, that's 49.5 uh, uh, cars per dealer uh, so far this year, about six cars a month. So they have a studio in Sydney and one in Parramatta. They've got designs on putting a, a place where you can go and buy these cars in Melbourne as well. And so it's very small beginnings. So 99 is probably um, being a little harsh because it's really only people in Sydney at this point that, that can buy one of the things. So it, I, think, I think the depth of pockets from Hyundai means that they'll be in here for the long haul. But would it be fair to say that 98 of those 99 cars had HC plates? Because the only place I've seen them is higher cars. Like it's a cheap, it's a cheap 
uh, airport limo. And it's probably not been yeah. a good year for buying airport limos. No. It's been a very, very bad year for buying airport limos. That's that's yeah. for sure. Um, and I think the the oh, you want to call it a false start where Genesis came in kind of clearly under the Hyundai umbrella, and it was very mm. much that. It was a large luxury type car, but at yeah. a much more affordable price. Is an impediment that they have to get over and and try and wash that impression away and establish Genesis as something something more. Mm. To be fair, I met a bloke in, uh, who was in Sydney and had driven his Genesis up from Adelaide and was raving to me about it. So he much preferred right. a BMW or Mercedes. He, he was couldn't be happier with the service and so on. It was was ranting about how great it was. And wow. I asked, I just okay. asked him where he'd hidden his HC plates. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was a Genesis dealer, but uh, yeah, that's no, right. dealer. did he did he have the story, the cap on? <laughs> he was, he was suit. driving me somewhere. He was driving me. <laughs> He's just driving you insane. You know that story's not true because I haven't been to the airport forever. No, no. So I suppose I suppose it just does pose the question: Why do you invest in a market when when it seemingly there makes it just makes no financial sense to continue? Citroen is is one to me that just seems a head scratcher because mm. that's a small number of cars with a big investment in keeping dealers on board and and all of that. But it'd be it'd be great to get people listening or or watching get your feedback as well. Uh, and see what you make of it to put some kind of rationale on that. Because mm. I've been saying the same thing for years. Like, we're, yeah, we're, we're going to yeah. stick. We've got a very specific set of buyers. They're a particular kind of people. People who don't yeah. buy cars, apparently. But yeah. um, <laughs> they're, uh, <laughs> they're, they're, they're sticking with it over and over again to the point where I, it doesn't make sense to me. I don't know why they're still here. I predict gotta, they'd be gone three years ago. Well, you have to admire the persistence. But at what point? You know, like I wonder if there's an official protocol uh, in in each car maker. Uh, you know, at what point do you pull the pin? Do you say, right, you know, do we get under 50 sales mm. every six? Do we just pull the pin? You know, is oh, it not I perfect? think that would be, yeah. <laughs> be an interesting conversation with uh, Mary Barrett, GM, about, um, you know, when, yeah. when do you actually uh, pull the pin? You pull the pin. Uh, it's all about timing. But the, the, there are a couple of things there. One is, uh, you know, if you want to consider yourself a global brand, we're a continent, you probably want to be represented in Australia. You know, there might be something psychological about it. Who knows? Mm. We just, yeah. we're yeah. international. We have to be in Australia. Um, so now we're going to move to cars that we can actually uh, drive day to day, and we have been in our garage. And, uh, Steve, I want to start with you. You have been in what has been an iconic car that has changed dramatically. Tell us about it. So, yes, I was in a Land Rover Defender, which apparently is very exciting. And um, I, I never really engaged with the old one because I'm not kind of a, a crafty SUV type person. But there was an old one there, so I went and sat in it. And it felt like it was designed by someone who'd never seen a human body. And, like, he was like, <laughs> crammed my elbow, was in my nose. And all this kind of stuff. I was like, oh, what a piece of crap. Anyway, people love this car, right? So I got in the new one. I was like, well, this is very nice. And uh, but what I don't understand, we went did all this really hardcore four-wheel driving. At one point, I wasn't even touching the pedals. Everything was happening automatically with the software, and I was literally just driving with one finger. And after about five minutes, I was over it, but it went on for about 19 hours. And I would describe the experience as being in a very high-end tumble dryer. It was wonderful <laughs> just being around. And driving. This is so great. But my, my question is why are people excited about it? It was probably crafty you could explain. And... Where is the joy if, if a numpty like me can drive this, you know, these incredibly difficult roads with no skill whatsoever? Surely all the fun has gone out of it now. Where Where is the fun if, if I can do it? So that's my question for the expert. Uh, well, the, I was, the, uh, the adventure well, editor. Well, unfortunately, there's no expert here, but I'll, I'll address <laughs> your... Uh, <laughs> um, my I, was, I was on exactly the same launch, but on a different rotation, and... Uh, it didn't go for 19 hours. It might have felt like it did the old race car. The old Defender, it's it's kind of a romantic notion of days gone by. Uh, uh, people so love, old. It, love it because it's an icon and because, yeah, your elbow sticks out the window because it's got an offset driving position and it's and it's harsh and it's underpowered. And yeah, Well, that's if you're a farmer. You can wave to people. Your arm's already that's there. That's true. Um, the Queen has one, doesn't she? They are, yeah. They are very capable and uh, and always have been. Um, I think a lot of people are in love with the idea of them and then the reality, once they get one, 
it involves quite a lot of uh, maintenance and work and, and tender loving care and lots and lots of money uh, and lots and lots of cloth to clean up the, the oil spills in your driveway and that sort of thing. Uh, but they are very capable. Um, and the new Defender, I mean, we only got to drive the petrol hybrids. Uh, well, I did anyway, because um, that was, well, there weren't any diesels available and there weren't any uh, short wheelbase Defenders. They sold them all, right? Yeah, exactly. So demand is through the roof. Um, mm. But they are unlike any Defender that I've ever been in. And I've got a couple of mates who've got one tens and that sort of thing, and they love them. And I've, I've, I've had the, the pleasure uh, as dubious as it is uh, of driving them uh, several times on and off road, uh, and traditionally on road they've been, you know, it's yeah, it's been, well, as you mentioned the 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 sort of any concessions to comfort and safety, uh, well there are none. So, no. um, but that new thing is unbelievable. I mean, on road you would have had fun throwing it around those corners, yeah. and, and, and it was great. Uh, it really was. <laughs> it's it's it it feels to me. A lot like a, a dis- well, it looks like a discovery that's been rammed onto a brick. Like it's like a, it's got a little bit of a shape, like a defender, but there's a lot of discovery in there, and a, a lot of sort of Land Rover niceties and technology and that sort of. It it feels almost not a defender. Um, they could have yeah. called it something else, and it, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure it it probably would have done okay. But attaching that name to it. Uh, is uh, is yeah, is a great thing for it. Um, you are correct. You do feel a few steps removed from the process when you're four wheel driving in it, mm. uh, but you can't deny that the technology is is unbelievable. But it just removes you from the experience a little bit. I, you know, I found, and I did say my my review and my video that I, I talk about being dialed into the experience a lot because you feel. You know, you feel where the wheels are and you feel what's going on and you can sort of, it's very engaging. And, and I, I didn't feel that in that Defender. I mean, it was very comfortable, very capable uh, in all, you know, in terms of everything. But I just didn't feel engaged in the experience. And, and like you, after a little while, of, and that was, that was a pretty decent off-road course. And, and hats off yeah. to Land Rover. They, they always put their things, well, especially if it's a Defender or a Disco or something, they always put them in in very decent off-road scenarios so you can get an idea of, of the vehicle's capabilities. The course, there wasn't a problem with it. Um, mm. yeah, that was a great course. But, yeah, you, you feel yeah you feel almost removed from the experience. Uh, it's a good thing in a way, Corbs, because it brings more people into the fold and they can experience off-roading and it's not so intimidating and, and, and you know, butch and hairy and beardy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but for traditionalists, it's, too easy. it's old, like it's like a self-driving exactly. Porsche. It like is, it's like yeah. a, it's like you can go around corners as fast as you like, but the software does it for you. Yeah. I don't want to. Yeah. I want to drive the car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So, um, yeah. Look, if if they're selling very quickly, as Steve says, I just wonder, Crafty, did you sign the one that you drove? I wonder whether that may <laughs> add a little bit of value. They could sell that as an LE, a limited oh, edition. Did, yeah. No, that's that's gone, and I did more than sign it. I'll I'll give you the. <laughs> Um, but uh, another thing uh, and uh, another sort of aspect of them that I guess is a few steps away from the old uh, Defenders, again, is the fact that it is really nice to drive on road. Like it was unreal. You couldn't, you can't sit in it and imagine that it's ever had any links to, to the Defenders of old because it is very nice. And, um they do start, I mean, we're yet to see the 90s, as I mentioned. Um, so we saw the ones that are uh, sort of 90,000, 100,000. And then you kit it out with all the accessories and the packs, like they've got adventure packs and urban packs. And so that adds all the accessories and whatever. So the prices also get up fairly quickly. But, you know, I guess for, for that market, for the landy market and, 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 and people who uh, invested in the Defender as a vehicle, um, you know that that sort of dosh isn't a problem. So, yeah, yeah, all right. Well, that's um, that's a very interesting double take on on that vehicle. But Craft, you just chip in with um, your time behind the wheel of another um, one that you've been taking off road lately. Uh, I was in the the new Fortuna, 
um, the Toyota Fortuna. So that's uh, the, the seven seat uh, based on the Hilux uh, ladder frame chassis, uh, based on the Hilux platform. I've never been a big fan of it in the past. Like it was, it was never something special to me. And it, and in a realm where there's, you know, the Isuzu MUX and the Ford Everest and those sort of things that, uh, in terms of safety and, and capability and and, uh, and comfort, uh, the Fortuna never really set the world on fire as far as I was concerned. But um, in the new thing, uh, it's had a bit of a facelift bit of a tweak to the to the nose which looks good but the bigger news is the fact that it has more power and torque uh, uh 20 kilowatts and 50 newton meters from memory um it is it's its towing capacity has gone from 2800 kilograms to 3100 which brings it into line more with uh with its rivals um and fuel consumption is supposedly better we did find with our real uh, test figures that yeah it was down a little bit um and yeah and i think you know in the grand scheme of things those are small ish changes but they've made a huge difference and it's always been very capable um off-road uh it's it, it's got a pretty good off-road uh traction control system good low range gearing good wheel travel um it's got the rear diff lock um and we did some pretty serious stuff in it and uh, and it did it all, did it all pretty comfortably. And on road, it's it's much better than it was before. Like I said, those those small power and torque uh, sort of upticks have made a huge difference. So yeah, I, I was impressed. Um, but you'll have to read my yarn and watch my <laughs> sit through my video, JC. To <laughs> oh, I look, I already that, have crafty. You're assuming that endure I have it. it. <laughs> endure it. <laughs> endure it. There, that's it. Yeah. But, endure uh, the Fortuna. <laughs> that's it. But um, right. yeah, yeah, pretty good. A lot better than it used to be. And, Very uh, good. I okay. See, I see up on Corby's shared screen that he's just uh, put down a deposit on a new Defender. Congratulations, mate! <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> I can uh, I can chime in at the end um, with the Audi A4 All Road. There are various uh, variants of of this model. This was the 40 TDI uh, Quattro, so a turbo diesel. Uh, version of this car at just under seventy thousand dollars before you put it on the road so it's uh like an outback except a lot more money and a lot more premium um and it's a two liter seven speed dual clutch all-wheel drive 140 kilowatts 400 newton meters and all of those newton meters are available from just 1750 so you've got that nice low down torque um the car I had was running on optional 19 inch rims it's normally on 18 so it looked a little bit racier um, I think in the plus column, I would have that it's eager, you know, naught to 100 in 7.9, so, you know, around eight seconds, is pretty urgent in terms of the performance. It's quiet on the inside, not so much on the outside, but it is very quiet. You'd be flat out guessing that it was a diesel vehicle when you're, when you're driving um, inside it. Comfy, good equipment, quality, um, and a lot of thoughtful design in, when you're using the load part uh, of the wagon. It's been carefully thought through. But on the negative side, no AEB as standard, which seems like uh, a mega miss. You actually have to buy the Assistance Plus package for about three grand, um, which puts in what Audi calls pre-sense front, which is actually AEB, um, as well as adaptive cruise and a few other um, interesting bits and pieces, 360-degree cameras, park assist, all that stuff. So you've got to pay extra um, to get what I sh believe should be standard in a car of that money particularly. Um, then I also found the, the drive experience overall just a little bit sterile. You know, there wasn't a lot of personality to the car. It did everything very efficiently. And this is a subjective call. Obviously, it, it's just me. But it's, the kind of, it's kind of the way it left me. Um, it was a, a little bit eh, um, underwhelmed. And really, if you need it for um, some, some towing with that extra torque from the um, diesel engine, or the high ground clearance if you need to tow something that's on, you know, off highway, but not necessarily hardcore off road. Fair enough. But I'd be looking at the A4 Avant, which is, you know, your your more typical road going wagon, the 45 um, TFSI, it's Quattro, and S line at 71 grand, 71,400 as an on road proposition. I'd be heading that way, but uh, people may have their specific needs, and uh, maybe the all road meets those. But yeah, bit of a bit of an interesting one for mine.
I'm surprised dual road exists still because it was sort of like when everyone was not quite ready to go into SUVs. It's like an SUV for someone who really wants a wagon. And so they were like, they were like just trying to mark it out. Well, let's build something that's a little bit between. But now everyone just buys a Q. You know, everyone Correct. wants a Q5 or a Q. Yeah, right. So right. why not? And I, I would personally just buy a station wagon. Yes. So I'd go. Yes. I'd go all before. So the all road for me just it's a little bit pregnant. It doesn't know. Uh, it doesn't know quite know what it is. I'm, I'm surprised that there are still buyers for it. But obviously, yeah. more people buy those than buy Citroens. <laughs> that's true, that's true. Um, but anyway speaking of interesting things and a very interesting person it's time for must watch must watch right now first of all you'll be pleased to know um, we, we saw this on Jalopnik. I'm a bit of a Jason Torchinsky uh, fan. I'll, I'll put my hand up to that. I, I enjoy his perspective on the world. They've said someone's planning a Tesla dating app for you weirdos who can't get off unless you're staring at a picture of Elon. Um, so <laughs> um, he, he goes on to say, wouldn't you like to find a partner who understands that sometimes true love is based on mutual or consuming admiration for an electric car company and its billionaire founder? <laughs> along with the inclusion of a homemade cardboard standee of Elon Musk in your love play. Uh, of course you would. And finally, it seems that someone understands as Tesla dating is now a thing. And that's what it's called. It's called Tesla dating. Now, it's probably satire. Um, I think it's almost overwhelmingly uh, the case that it is satire. But um, look, Tesla owners already have a reputation for being some of the most, uh, you know, adoring. So it's putting that adoration towards this website and it says it's the dating app for tesla lovers because you can't spell love without ev and uh, <laughs> th this is this is the way it's described on the website oh, an exclusive no. community of like-minded elon stands which uh, i'm led to believe means zealous fans um you know the kind of people that really understand you sign up below for early access so the website exists um, and you've got to prove your Tesla ownership before the before no. the site actually wow. the app launches. They had some um, potential candidates, like they had some some mock um, Tesla uh, owners. Mia, twenty eight, owns a twenty twenty Model Three. She's an atheist, dreamer, eco lover, looking for adventures and fun. Full self driving, so you can meet me in the back seat. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, will it really? Well, it feature auto, you know, what is it, autopilot that someone else can have sex for you while you sleep? <laughs> um, Andy, 36, 2017 Model S performance. Uh, he's an ISTJ, which, of course, is his Myers-Briggs uh, personality profiling uh, uh, score. Uh, he's 5 foot 10, and he loves long drives next to the beach and vegan tacos. So oh. I, think, I, think this is, I think this is where the... Um, the fact that it may well be satire uh, comes to the fore. Uh, anyway, have a look at it. It's a bit of a laugh. The other thing is, sorry, go ahead. I'm signing up. <laughs> you are. I would too. But you've got to own a Tesla first. Well, I'll buy one just to get involved. Just to get in. You'll be in your Defender. Uh, no, I, I want a Model 3 performance. As soon as I can find somewhere to charge it, I'm ready to go. Okay. okay. So Elon has been on the Twitters again, and he said during the week, He's speed running Factorio in real life. So this caused me to do a little bit of online research, a bit of desk research. And Factorio is, of course, a computer game. Uh -huh. And it's where an engineer has crash landed on an alien planet and then needs to harvest resources and create industry to build a rocket to get off that planet. So various people had thoughts on this uh, in response to Elon's tweet. Jason Higgins said, and his, his actual handle is at Captain Dammit, which I absolutely love as a name yeah. uh, for Twitter. He says, Factorio is about destroying a planet for your own selfish ambition, <laughs> which, is, which is one way of looking <laughs> oh, at it. Okay. Yeah. And Vash the Stampede, whose handle is at communism, misspelt, um, says, Kanye West at POTUS and yourself need to start a business together. And my mind was just boggling in terms of what kind of business that actually uh, might be. Um, Christian says, you mean Cracktorio, don't you? Best 2,000 hours of my life. And that was, a, that was a similar kind of theme, that people were heavily addicted to this game. Michael Jackson, obviously back from the dead, says, Elon 
can I have a 2020 Roadster in white? And Sarah, Sarah Dobby says, supposed to be picking up a brand new Series 3 Tesla tomorrow, only to be told today it's got a power steering issue. What the hell? Four exclamation points. And that's something <laughs> common to most of uh, Elon's tweets, is you'll just get those random customer complaints uh, in the feed. Um, he's also posted a meme based on uh, a football scene where an attacking player is marked with a little speech bubble saying, trying to post fire content. And then coming at him are three to three or four defenders, um, and one's legal, the other is sales, the other one's getting <laughs> sued, and the fourth one is more legal. So he's, you know, crying and having a whinge about he can't post what he wants to um, yeah. on online. And Jungle TB says, Tesla stock too high again? Which I thought was an interesting comment, given that in May this year, he was tweeting about the stock being too high. Um, the allegation being that he wanted to acquire some more stock and wanted to drive the price down. And, yeah. and again, was, um, you know, stepping on the toes of the SEC in the US because he's not meant <clears throat> to tweet anything that may impact the value of Tesla shares before it's been legally vetted uh, by independent people. So I I'm guessing that Jungle TB is right. That's a reference uh, to that that he's making. Mm -hmm. um, Igor Koteyev says, hello, Musk. How are you? My name is Igor. I live in Belarus. And that's it. That's, that's his comment. Right. Yep. Right. So I thought, you know, maybe he'll get back to Igor. Yeah. And Wayne G. House, who is an obvious genius, says, <laughs> Hi, Elon. I have some amazing ideas. Wheels have to spin as we drive. So basically, if we can get those spinning rims to generate electricity, theoretically, we can keep our batteries charged as we are driving. <laughs> so that's you know wow. that's the kind of uh, imagination imaginative powerhouse that he's coming back and interacting with elon online but we were just touching on the share price it's now 441 dollars 76 it was 366 last week so it's it's gained most of its its losses and according to barons um, they're not alone in thinking that a lot of that is down to one thing which is batteries and upcoming is a battery day where Elon is finally going to give us the details on what he has been hinting will be breakthrough game-changing battery tech uh, that will see updates with better capacity, reliability, range, the whole technology thing. And um, look, there are various people putting the theory that this is part of his grand plan to not only improve Tesla's, but he's always said he wants to be the battery supplier for EVs globally. So this could be a significant day. So we'll, we'll see what happens and what, what that means for the share price uh, afterwards as well. It does sound visually exciting, doesn't it, him standing in front of a battery? I hope he hits it with a baseball bat or... You know, <laughs> throws, throws a, throws a, um, a shot put. Um, yeah. to see to see how it goes and it it crumbles into many pieces at least or a, uh, or he does some of his really cool dancing again that's always oh, good oh he's Boy, great no. at the dad dancing yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah the one the one thing he doesn't do is the pointing a lot of dads get oh, into yeah. the, the yeah. pointing I, know, I i was looking for that but uh yeah <laughs> bit of that bit of that he didn't do that um but i think with that we have reached the finish line and i want to say thank you steve and thank you, Crafty. No, thank um, you. Oh, pleasure. And thank you. And Steve. thanks to our eviction technician, garment removal specialist, and lead milk frother, Mr. Pritchard, for making <laughs> us making us stand out and look better, far better than we should. Today, he's wearing a t-shirt saying, "My mum cuts my hair, mm. Trump sweatpants, mm -hmm. and astronaut apres ski boots," which yeah. is an incredible, incredible ensemble. Yeah. Um, please pass on the word about the podcast and let us know your thoughts by searching for Cars Guide on Facebook and Instagram using the hashtag CG Podcast or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. Please do that. If you're an Apple Podcast listener, please rate and review us. And remember, you can watch us on YouTube. But before we go, an auto electrician mate of mine's put his son on as an apprentice. Um, he noticed that he kept biting the wires, so he had to ground him. <laughs> oh, oh, boy. Technical joke. <laughs> oh, boy. Hold on. I'm just going to note that down to tell my kids later. Yeah. <laughs>